Coming up on Unpacked. I decided I'm going to take the leap. It was tough because there was a lot of people that were dependent on me, but I felt either now or never. Oh my goodness, if I get this promotion, it means I'm going to have less time for my art. That's when I knew that mm, I don't think I see a future here. This is not about money, you know, as such. It's about purpose. Leaving your traditional nine-to-five job to start a completely new career, both of our guests are here to share their stories. Let's unpack. Kharangua born Neo Mahlangu was always fascinated with the world of art. At school, she participated in various arts activities, winning several awards. She, however, took a different direction after school and worked in the medical field. Her true calling, however, kept knocking on the doors of her soul. The entrepreneurial bug bit Temba from primary school, where he started selling peanuts from a matchbox. With ambitions to be a writer after school, he then became a journalist. In 2010, he left his job to follow his dreams, sending his life on a roller coaster to finding his purpose. These are their stories. Let's unpack. Now, welcome to the show. Thank you so much for joining us. Thank you for having me. Temba, and to you as well, welcome to the show. Oh, thank you. Thank you. So take me back to your childhood. When you were in school, yeah. what did you always want to do? What did you dream of doing with your life as a kid? I've always known that I wanted to be an artist. Um, it's always been something that I think my life has been showing me. Mm. Um, when I was a kid, I was really good in school. And I think that made the decision to transition into the arts a very tough one because... Um, you are yeah, good academically. Yes, I was yes. good academically. I went to one school from preschool to high school. So I had a great relationship with my teachers and with learning. And mm. I had a great art teacher. And I think I've always known I just didn't have the courage to mm. take that leap of faith. What about you? What did you always want to do when you were a child? Um, with me, okay, it began with, you know, your what I was exposed to at the time. Mm -hmm. So you are exposed to being told you can be a doctor. Yes. <laughs> you know, the typical lawyer. things black kids the, get told. Yes, <laughs> so at the time when I was growing up, it was always either I'm going to be a lawyer or... But as I grew up, I started getting exposure to different careers and different stuff. That's when I started moving around. But I was bouncing up and down like a yo-yo because one minute I want to be an artist, yes. like she's saying, the next minute I want to be to get into corporate and be an engineer. But eventually I, I found myself at a point where I started enjoying writing. Mm. And I saw that maybe one day I might go into that. Mm -hmm. So yeah, that's how. And in terms of your family background, because we're also heavily influenced by our parents' lives and what they are doing. And usually when they're in certain professions, they expect us to follow. What was the family setup like? And how did that influence you? Mm, it influenced me very strongly. So my dad was a detective and my mom was just a stay-at-home mom. Mm. But growing up, we had this pass, uh, the shop, or, you know, mm. and I was always the, like, the manager of yes. the shop, even though I was in high school. And I think that gave me a very strong entrepreneurial spirit. Mm. And it, it wasn't um, a scary thing to take that leap of faith to become an entrepreneur, even though mm. it's a creative entrepreneur, because I feel like all my life I was groomed to yes. be in business. So and on your side, what was the home setup? What was everybody doing and how did it influence you? Okay, my dad was a laborer. He worked for a factory mm. all his life. My mom, on the other hand, she was more on, on the entrepreneur side. So, yes. you know, she, when I was a kid, she used to sell jerseys. And the interesting thing is that she would measure people just by looking at them. Mm. She wouldn't have a tape measure. And, and I used to observe that and, you know, and I was quite, you know, uh, um, sort of fascinated by mm. it. But then she did a whole lot of things. She sold different things and, mm. you know, so I had that experience of seeing my dad going to work and also seeing my mom just hustling for herself. Mm -hmm. yeah. mm. So while you were going to school, at some point 
you know, especially towards matric, people start saying, where are you going to go? What yeah. are you going to study? Yeah. What was that conversation like for you? For me, I had two options. It was either the arts or something in the health sciences because I was really fascinated about the body. Mm. But I think not being exposed to representations of a young black creative woman um, when I was younger, it didn't give me an example to look up to. So mm. it felt like it was an impossible thing to do. So mm. it makes sense that where, when I went to varsity, I went with the second option because I saw other people uh, succeeding in those traditional ways, right? Mm. But <laughs> after a while, your calling really gets very loud and you can't say no. What was uh, your parents' response? I mean, to them, was art even an option? No. So that was your option, but that <laughs> was not their option. Yeah, I followed their option when I was younger, when I was 15, and it was time to submit those university forms yeah. because what else could I do, you know? Mm. And they were also funding my study, so I kind of had, I felt obliged to follow the rules, you know? But after I graduated, I just realized that uh, I'm an adult and I kind of have given them what they want, mm. but I know what is within me and I know what I'm capable of doing. So I'll just have to show them. So in terms of what they had in mind for you, what were they encouraging you to do? They were just encouraging me to be successful. But when I look at my parents' past, they grew up in a past that really um, celebrated survival. Yeah. And it makes sense that they instilled those things in me where they want me to do well, they want me to be okay, they want me to be, you know. Mm -hmm. But I feel like we live in a different age and uh, success can look different. And it was hard to convince. I've, I've had, I think that's why I've worked so hard, so that yes, I could show yes. them that I'm going to be fine. Like, yes. this is not a death sentence. It's actually possible to be successful in yes. this. Yeah. So for you, I mean, you had a father who, laborer, believed in, you know, hard work, yeah. showing up for a job. Come time for your matric and it being like, what are you doing next? What were your parents encouraging you to do and what did you decide to do? Okay, my dad, because of that whole laborer thing, mm. he was more exposed to you know, the engineers where he worked, they were engineers and mm. he saw how much they were earning. Yes. And they they got like the best, you know, packages in terms of salaries. They drove the nicest car. So it was just for him, he was like, you need to be an engineer. Mm. You know, you need to study physics and mathematics mm. and be an engineer because you will have a better life than I've had. And with my mom, my mom unfortunately passed away when I was young. So, mm. so I was raised by my dad. So he insisted on that. So by the time I got into matric, I was studying physics and mathematics, even though I didn't enjoy Yes. studying those things, but I just wanted to make him happy. And But I realized that engineering is not for me. Mm. Um, the thing that I'm really passionate about is more on the writing side. So that's when I decided. But actually, to to be honest, at that time, I also I just wanted to get into business after yeah. the trick. But because of the situation and the background that I'm, um, I come from, I had to make that decision to say, I have to make this man happy and go and study you know, uh, um, uh, journalism. So was he happy with you choosing journalism considering he wanted you to be an engineer? Okay, he didn't understand it, yeah. but it's a career that, you know, it's, it's a bit fancy, you know, your name is going to be on the newspapers or you're yeah. going to be on TV or radio. So, so he wasn't, you know, um, 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 he wasn't against it. So he supported it, but he ideally he felt that I should have gone that route. Yes. But Either way, he just supported that decision. So what happened after um, you, or let me say rather, what happened during your studying journey? Because many people get to varsity, start to study the thing, and they're like, is this what this is about? I'm, I actually don't want to do this. Yeah. Okay, even when I was at varsity, I was that kid that always thought of ideas of what can I sell, yes. you know? So I was always that kind, you, you know, what? where are the opportunities? And... Whatever assignments we did, I always looked at an opportunity where I could do business. Mm. So I knew that even when I was studying, I knew that this is what I'm passionate about. You know, hustling. Hustling and, <laughs> you know, building yeah. my own thing. And so, so going through that process just showed me or revealed to me that mm. actually this is not for me as in 
doing it for life. It's mm -hmm. something that I can do maybe for a short while, but actually this is what I love. I love really coming up with stuff, creating stuff, and then, you know, uh, um, uh, selling it to, the, to, to people. So you got through Varsity and, I mean, we are facing the, such a massive crisis of graduates without jobs. Mm -hmm. Did you manage to get a first job? No, when I, when I got out, I still had that thing of, I want to start my own business. Yeah. So within the first year after finishing uh, varsity, I just want to start a, wanted to start a business. And I did actually for a couple of months and we had a fallout with my dad. Because so he who was started like, the business? I started the business. With your dad? No, my, but just your by own myself, business. yes. Okay. And we just had a fallout because he was like, if you're going to take this route after studying, then you might as well even leave my, my house, you know, just go, go and do your own thing because you want to do things your own way. So what so, was the business? Um, at the time, it was a signage business. We were doing like uh, signs for events. Mm. And I was also, also doing sound hire and all mm. of those things. So at that time, so he was like against it. And that's when I decided maybe I should just go look for a job just to make him happy again. Nothing like a little emotional blackmail to yo, push yo, in the right is, direction. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> it is rough, so. Okay, and then for you, you, you went and studied the health science. Did you have in mind what it was you wanted to be doing with your qualification? Not really. I just knew that I didn't want to be a doctor. I didn't want to be patient facing. I just did not have the patience yes. for it. Um, but I, I was still very interested in the business side of it. So I was lucky enough after graduating, I entered a graduate program. And the way they trained me in that program is something that I will forever be thankful for because yeah. I feel like it made me more entrepreneurial because yes. it, was, it was very like, big organization, corporate, this is how we do things, right? And I think the way they train me in sales, in speaking, in presenting myself, in understanding what goes into a business is something that I thought I was going to hate because I had the same spirit of, I want to do my own thing. But I'm so glad that I didn't immediately jump into my career because yeah. that training is something I would not have gotten anywhere else. Yes, mm. because you've taken some skills from there mm. and you're using them in real life right now. Yeah. Okay, so um, after your graduate program, <laughs> what happened? So I was taken into the company that I, was, I started with and... The first two years were okay. I was just not happy. It felt like putting a square peg into a round hole. You know, yeah. I, I didn't feel like I belonged. Um, and it's not because the company was terrible or my manager was terrible, none of that. It was just a feeling, a sense that I am not, I'm not meant to be here. Mm -hmm. And what I did was while I was working, um, I clocked into work early and left early. And after work, then I would draw and paint. And before work, I'd draw and paint. And then I'd go to work. And then I'd just do that for a couple of months. And after that, my career started to pick up on the creative side while I was managing my 9 to 5 at the same time. Oh, and, and I mean, that's what a lot of people start to do mm. is that they start to work around their 9 to 5 life. Because at the end of the day, you're at a point in your life where you need to be earning an income, right? Yeah. You've moved out of home. Yeah. You've got bills to pay. Yeah. Okay. So for you, you you finally, you know, dad has twisted your arm to getting yeah. a J-O-B. Yeah. Uh, what is the first job that you get? Is it as a journalist? Yeah, as a journalist. Yeah. Um, and, you know, once I started as a journalist, it was a situation of, I grew up in the townships. I wasn't exposed to a whole lot of things. And here's this job that takes you around the country. Yeah. You go interview interesting people. And I started enjoying it, actually. I was like, hey, this is fun because you get to hear different life stories. And, yes. you know, so I enjoyed it for a while until, um, you know, it got to a point where I got a job at a magazine. Mm. And when it started being, what I loved about it, before I could get into that, what I loved about it is, I felt like I was making some positive impact in the community. Mm. There was something, every time I'd written a story, there'd be somebody that would come back and say, mm. you know, that story impacted me this mm. way and all of that. But after a while, when I moved into a magazine, 
we started writing more gossip stuff. Mm. And gossip stuff is more about bringing people down, mm. finding stuff that's not, you know, good. And I felt, you know what, this is not my calling, you know. Mm. I, I, I really wanted to create or do something that will, you know, help or serve somebody out mm. there. And I, that's when that moment hit me, you know, to know, to say, you know, actually, there was this thing that you had when you were growing up, you know, that you wanted to do your own thing. Mm. And now look at you, you are writing, you know, tabloid stuff about celebrities and it's stuff that you don't agree Did with. Did you ever write about me? <laughs> 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 yeah, okay. I want to say it. <laughs> only good stuff. <laughs> only, only the good stuff. So I'm so. curious about your relationship with your father. Yes. When you got the job, did you guys reunite? Yeah, no, we, we, we had the best relationship because, hey, they were saying, you know, we see your son is doing, you know, you know how it is when you start getting praises and mm. they say, yo, your son is doing so well. We saw him here. I was reading a story and I saw his name. Mm. So... We, 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 we got back, we had, the relationship was patched and everything went, went back to normal. So, but during that period, that's when it hit me that, you know what, I don't agree with this and I've got something bigger, something that I want to do for, for, for my community or for people uh, um, other than this. So I understand that there was an incident with your dad at a boss's house. What was that incident and what, what was the realization that you came to? Okay, so, um, you know, they, there's always those events. Uh, I mean, he had been there for years mm. at the same company, so they give you awards. Long and they, service. It's long service, and yeah. they're like, you know, bring your kids, you know, so we can celebrate. And when I went, uh, on that day, he told me a story. He was like, you see that uh, guy that's giving us the awards? He's actually my boss. Mm. But actually, the story is that guy is the boss, the, the first guy that hired him. Um, uh, uh, that was his son. So mm. he knew the son when the, the son was very like little and, and saw him grow up in front of his eyes to a point where now the, the father relinquished the, you know, the, the thing to, to the son to say, now take over. Mm. And I was like, okay, so my dad been working here for so long to a point where mm. a, a kid is now his boss, you yes. know, he has to answer to him. And I thought, mm. you know, I've always wanted to build something myself, you know, that could be passed on from one generation to another. Mm. And when I looked at my dad and I thought, that means if he lives here, he's not going to pass this thing on to me, mm. you know. And that really, really, that day just, you know, changed my life. Because when I looked at that and when he told me the story, it was such an emotional thing. But, you know, I've been working here for so long that now... The, the boss's son is my boss, and I felt I, I just want to change that narrative. And it's not even son, family. like child. Like child, child. One. He has to take the instructions now from him. Wow. This is someone that he used to carry around mm. and play with, and sure. I said, no, this has to, to change. Mm. So what was your next move after you are writing rubbish about celebrities? <laughs> 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 oh, it was a tough one because um, I'd gotten used to the life. I'd gotten used to the salary, mm. you know. So I decided I'm going to take the leap. It was tough because there was a lot of people that were dependent on me. You know, we come from those situations where if you get a job, it's not just for you. Yes. There's that cousin that you are helping, yeah. your siblings, yeah. you know. And so to take that decision was tough. But I felt either now or never. So, was the decision for you, like, did you have an exit strategy that was over a period of time to say in this time, I'm going to save this much a month? Or were you like, hi, I'm done? Uh, me, I was done. <laughs> I was like, hey, I'm done. I'm okay, done with this so thing. you were done. I don't have a plan that's really, you know, solid that's going to... I was like, okay, I have an idea what I'm going to do. Because at the time... Um, I, you know, had so many relationships. So I thought ah, I could get into PR. Mm. You know, that would be easier. I'm a writer and I've, yes. I've met so many people. I could do PR for artists, yes. write, you know, bios and all of that. So and after you wrote rubbish about them, you're like, can I be your publicist? Because <laughs> I know how it works. Yes. So yes. I can spin it around for you, you know. Yes. So that was like the easiest way out. So that's what the first thing that I did mm. when, I, when I eventually resigned. I said it was easy. I was just going to capitalize on the relationships that I'd, you know, had at the time. So that's the first thing I did. 
And what was the next thing you did? And how did the PR thing end? Uh, the PR thing, people get excited in the first month. They're all telling you, we're going to give you the jobs, the contracts. Don't worry, we got you. You know, you're quitting? Fine, don't worry. We'll... And then six months later, nobody's taking your call. And it just You were stalking tough. them. <laughs> <laughs> So a couple of months later, I realized this is getting tough because, you know, now I had these big dreams that this thing is going to be huge. I'm going to have this agency, you know, that has all of these contracts. But a year into it, it just got tougher and tougher. I had a partner. I had a car. I had a, a place to stay. And then a year went by, second year went by, all of it was gone. So you were just left with what? With the ideas. And dreams. <laughs> and dreams. <laughs> ideas and dreams. At it's least you had something. <laughs> yeah, the, <laughs> the partner was born. I mean, Very we easy. can laugh about it now, <laughs> but like, there are people who literally lose everything chasing their dreams. Yeah. Yes. Mm. I, I was one of them. I lost, literally, I lost everything, you know. And did the, did, I just want to know if the girlfriend left after the money or before. No. Just when it was now getting finished, you know, <laughs> when you could count, you could say, okay, these are the last couple of rands here. So this is now. She left with the, the last town. rand. Yeah, let me just take flight. So you could tell, look at that now, it's tough. So, yeah. so when she left, I think it was a year after I uh, quit my job. So by the second year, I was like, I'm going back. Yo, this is tough. I never thought this was going to be this tough. Mm. Oh. I took my CV, dusted my CV, started calling the editors. Yeah, give me the job back. Yes, yes. And they gave me the job back at the, at the magazine. But it was like, um, just to, the, the best way to put it was like, you know when you've had a relationship with somebody and then you broke up mm. and then you see them after a couple of years and they're looking nice and you're like, oh my goodness, uh, what, what happened? We should reconnect. Mm. But when you reconnect, you realize why you left in the first place. <laughs> You're like, reminded. You're reminded, Ute. The reason I left this job yeah. was because of one, two, three. So I just went back. I, I think I worked for like six months and then I was like, I know. Mm. Let me. So did you quit with a plan or again you quit without a plan? Uh, this time I, I said, I'm going to go into it with that mentality of uh, find something to sell, buy for a rent, sell for two. Yes. Because I could see the whole contract thing was not. Uh, sustainable yeah. for me. So so this time the plan was different. I was like, I'm going to do it differently. I want something that's going to give me cash flow, mm. that's going to give me sustainability. So yes, there was a plan, you know, but uh, <laughs> everybody has a plan until <laughs> you implement it. And, you know, so I went out and I started again. So um, what was your first thing that you were doing, the first business you did? The first business I did was a signage business. So you went back to the to signage. signage, yeah. Mm. So I started doing signage. Um, actually, the business was very interesting. I was doing house numbers, and I was selling. I was selling house numbers to you know households in the townships, and I, I would meet so many people that knew me from the journalism days. They were like, "Dude, are you crazy?" Mm. So you left <laughs> mm. this prestigious, you left that prestigious job to sell us house numbers. What's wrong with you? <laughs> <laughs> so, 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 so I was doing that for a while, and but it taught me a lot of things because it taught me to, you know, to deal with different kinds of people. So that was the first business that I did. And and what were the subsequent business? Because you dabbled in a few things. Yeah, you were quite a couple. And you know what happens when you get out? You start thinking, um, I just need something that will make money. You know, it, it stops being about purpose. It stops about being about serving. And I'm so glad I went through that process. And afterwards, I, I learned my lessons that I have to get back to purpose and serving. But mm. during that period, it was about what can make me money. If somebody says to you, hey, hey, you know, if you can sell some flowers, it's going to make you money. If you can sell cars, if you can sell. So it was that type of vibe. Why do I feel like you started a permit scheme? <laughs> <laughs> That's one of your businesses. <laughs> <laughs> you know, if you, when you are in it, you start looking at everything. Yeah, you know, yeah, you meet yeah. people telling you shortcuts because mm. there's a lot of people that are selling shortcuts. Hey, yeah. you, if you can do this, you can get to a million quicker. So I did a lot of businesses before I got back to, you know, understanding that this is not about money, you know, as such. It's about purpose. What is my purpose and how am I going to serve people with, with it? So, but before that, 
I did a lot of stuff. I did a lot of stuff. So on your side, uh, Neo, mm. eventually, like you say, you did the art morning. It just became this thing to to cushion the blow of corporate yeah. to now be like, at least get, get Sirisa with the thing <laughs> that I love, you know? Yeah. When did you eventually say, I am done? It was when my manager approached me and said that I am eligible for a promotion. Mm. And the promotion was supposed to be a gig overseas. And I remember my first thought was, oh my goodness, if I get this promotion, it means I'm going to have less time for my art. Yeah. And that's when I knew that mm, I don't think I see a future here. Wow. Yeah, and I gave myself a couple of months. I gave myself a year, but it didn't It didn't reach the year. But As gave, in, like, that was part of your exit yeah, plan? Yeah, because I knew that because I was entering a very alternative industry, the first couple of months or maybe the first year was going to be a bit rough. So I started saving aggressively to make that transition a bit softer. Although I don't think anybody can prepare you for yes, that switch. Yes, yes. <laughs> I don't think anybody can, but I really tried to save as much as I could because I told myself, I'm not going to go home. We are, we, are, we are moving forward here. Yeah. We're not going backwards. So let's save as much as we can, do as much as we can. If it means no sleep, let's do. Let's move forward. Yeah. That was just the motto of the, the those six, seven months. And then there was a time where I don't remember if we were called for a meeting and I was like, no. <laughs> I can't. I can't do this. And emotionally, I was also drained. Physically, I was tired. And also, I could see the potential. I could see the light at the end of the tunnel because things were growing. You know, in at the background, things were growing. I was getting a little bit more attention. And I was like, okay. And maybe you can share with us, because you say you did art. Mm -hmm. So when you say things were growing, do you mean you stood on the side of the road the weekend? Yeah, I actually started with, artwork? not side of the road, but I started with markets when mm. markets were still a thing. And I used to see, you know, Kori Market thing, sometimes there are people who draw on the side. Yeah, yeah I, re I approached the market in Pretoria and I asked them if I could have a stand. Mm. And then they gave me a stand. And I remember while I was busy doing whatever I was doing, uh, a professor from one of the universities actually approached me and he was like, why don't you study art? And I told him, I don't have the money to study art. Yes. And then he gave me a contact for somebody in Joburg who had like studio spaces. And I reached out to that person and they were like, why don't you do an exhibition? I'm like, I've never done an exhibition. Yes. And then I did the exhibition and it was sold out. And like from so, there... And you had been obviously building your portfolio of pieces yeah. at home in your free time. So yeah. for you to have an exhibition, you needed to have a bit of a collection at home. Yeah, although it was very scary because all of these things I've never done before. But I was just saying yes because I wanted forward momentum, you yes. know. So I was just saying yes to things I just never understood. <laughs> I didn't yeah. understand what I was getting myself into. But over time, like, the picture started getting clearer and clearer and clearer. And I think that gave me the courage to say, hey, let me just downgrade my, my life. Let me sell my car. Let me move to a smaller place and see what this thing goes. So you didn't want to go to this meeting the one day. Yeah. Did you quit on the spot? You know, obviously I have to talk to HR, you know, because <laughs> they... Not like him who just was like... <laughs> I'm not writing about celebrities anymore. I'm out. <laughs> yeah, no, I had a full hour length meeting with my HR manager and I was just asking her questions like, am I crazy for thinking about this? Because it feels crazy. You have a stable, comfortable job and you want to leave it. Like, but it's not enough. Yeah, and it's not enough. It's just having the chat. But obviously, they are biased because they represent the company and they're going to be like, yeah, maybe you are a little crazy, you know? So And they're like... Stay because we need this role and we don't want to look for a new person, you know? I realized that I can't look at other people to guide my life. Um, other people won't have the answers that I seek. I have the answers within me already. I just need to have the courage to follow through with those answers, you know? So, yeah, that's why I left. And the first few years, I think it was like, you, oh, Lord. <laughs> Oh, those two years were brutal. But I think sometimes like God tests you to just see how much you want something. And I just grinned and bared it. And I knew that at some point, at some point, it's going to it's gonna follow through. So when you say the two years were rough, mm. do you mean like 
as in, oh my gosh, this is not as emotionally fulfilling as I thought it would be, mm. or rough just in the financial sense that I got so comfortable with a guaranteed salary, now I'm stressed. Yeah, it was rough financially and rough mentally because I had to unlearn the employee mindset. Um, I think if you're a person who is entrepreneurial, you understand that you have to let go of certain things, you have to let go of certain certainties, you have to learn certain things about standing on your own. So letting go of that employee mindset into an entrepreneurial mindset was the toughest thing for me. Mm. Um, it's like almost letting go of a parent's hand. It's, it's, it's yeah, you, I can't explain it. You just have to experience it. And then financially, I was pretty comfortable. That job was fancy, you know, it was So you nice. got to save quite a bit of money, you were okay? Not really. I was... Scraping by, I was making the most of what I had. <laughs> you know, my my, I didn't have millions in the bank account, but I really made sure that every single rand was spent wisely because yes. I didn't know the next job when that was going to be. You know, and, and luckily, art supplies are not cheap, and they're not cheap. They are really not. And I was lucky that that dry spell lasted three months, mm. and then I got a job as an art director because I realized that I had to just get an income just to, yes. yeah, just to buffer this <laughs> season, right? And then I got a job as an art director, and... How did they hire you with... Girl... <laughs> the universe <laughs> opened itself up for you. Yeah, I was just trying out different creative avenues. So I was um, illustrating, I was painting, I was just doing as much as I could, mm. and uh, my work landed at an agency's desk, and they were like, yeah, okay, you're talented, okay, come in. I stepped right in. And I think that was the basis of learning how to be a creative entrepreneur, yes. where the healthcare gig taught me how to be an entrepreneur in general. This one was a little bit more refined training, yes. but it was real life training. And I was there for a year, and then afterwards I was like, I think I can do this on my own. Yes, yes. Yeah. And I mean, just to, to, to go back for anyone watching about what you're saying of switching from employee mindset to entrepreneurial, when you're an employee, someone's telling you where to be, they, they, they give you deliverables, um, it doesn't matter to you whether the business meets target or not. When you're on your own, if you don't get up, there is no business. Yeah. There is no income. Yeah. You don't have a salary that comes in whether the business lost money or not. You, yeah. It's all about being independent and self-discipline. Yeah, the discipline is another level. It's a, it's a different kind of discipline where, yeah, you just, you shouldn't take anything less than what you deserve. You yeah. really, you really need to learn how to speak for yourself, understand your worth, know how to negotiate your worth. Those are things that maybe when you're an employee, you only talk about when you want a salary raise, you know? Mm. But when it comes with business, every single contract or every single job is that conversation. Yes. And obviously, you also want to grow in, in, in your career and in how much you earn and the opportunities that you earn. And sometimes you, you don't feel worthy, but you need to pretend mm. that you are. And that, that hot fire initiation that we constantly go through with running your own thing, yeah, it's something that you really, really need to, need to have if you want to have your own business. You can't expect somebody to give you something. You really have to go take it. It's, it's different. It's different. How did the parents react <clears throat> to you leaving this cozy job? They thought I was crazy. They still think I'm crazy. <laughs> <laughs> But I think it will last born. I think I have a cheekiness to just like challenge life. Mm. Um, and I always know that things are always going to work out for me. That's yeah. just something that I've always had. So they were scared for me, but I wasn't scared. Tell us about your big, big break that you got. Uh, I think for me, the biggest break I got was being asked to commission um, to design two Rand coins for the country. Uh, I was asked. I mean, that to... is a huge. Huge deal. How did they find your, your work to approach you? I wish I, I wish I, I wish I did. <laughs> they just sent me an email and they asked me if I was interested to take part in the project. I was actually asked to design one coin, but then as the project was rolling, I was, um, yeah, I was asked to design two. I was the youngest person, youngest woman, youngest black woman to ever do that. And yeah, I think that was my confirmation. Yeah, that... All of the work was worth it. 
Temba wants <coughs> to know how much you got paid. Why? <laughs> <laughs> Let Are you going to pay me the same? <laughs> no, but, but on the reels, the reason that we think about this because there's a perception that art doesn't pay, right? Okay. Except for the very high profile, the Nelson Magamo yeah. that we know are doing, you know, Enoch, all, yeah. all those artists. Yeah. We don't see many black women, young black women that are working artists. Yeah. And I mean, you're not the only one who is on the project. We know Lady Scully was on the project. Yeah. So... Give us an estimate. You know, I know it's tricky talking about money, but how much? No, are we talking I think six figures. Are we talking seven figures? I think it was enough. You it know, was I think, enough. Yeah, but I was fortunate enough that I met Bo Nelson and all of those people in the beginning of my career. And I think in anything that you do, you need to have uh, role models who are doing extremely well, so that they help with your mindset. Because I feel like mindset is everything. If you approach something and think that it's not going to work out. It's probably not going to work out. So because I saw these big guys who were who were um, excelling in what they were doing, I mean, success leaves footprints. It's only inevitable if I kind of follow the same path. It might not work out the same, but eventually. How do you put will. a price, though, to art which is subjective? It's very subjective. Yeah. Um, it's a provenance thing. So the way the art industry works is that the... Bigger your collaborations, your the the bigger your institute, an institute that you are affiliated with, um, the kind of projects like how you maneuver in the industry will increase the value of your work. So it's very important that at the beginning you are a little bit more aggressive with how you enter the industry, so that you are affiliated with the right people, so that when you do charge a price you can justify it. Mm. You don't just say, um, it's 50K. And for this piece. For yes. this piece, but <clears throat> like, what is your career? Like, what have you done for somebody else to give you that much money? So How it's... about my art is just pretty and you want it? No. Really? <laughs> Okay, no. okay. And I know, I know for those of us that are not in that industry, it's very difficult to be able to be like, how is this this much? We know that art around the world sells for crazy amounts. Yeah. Um, but beyond being a name, like you, people can just love a piece of, of artwork. But art is also an investment yes. that grows in value. So if you're putting in that much money into art, you want to put in money into somebody who looks like they have the potential to be better in 20, 30 years' time, mm. that will increase your investment. Mm. So it makes sense why you don't just say, hey, this is 50K. Um, you know, you need to justify it because the client also has something to gain from your career and your success. Mm. So, yeah, I hope that makes sense. No, it does, it does. In terms of your business, seeing as you tried everything, including the pyramid scheme, <laughs> what did you land on? <laughs> <laughs> so, so because um, of the PR business that I'd done in the beginning, I still had like connections and so I would get like an odd a job from a, like a PR job yeah. now and again. So it happened that one time I got this PR job, like it was a big one. It was for the Mandela family. Yes. There was a wedding and they needed somebody to do the PR. Mm. And I just got a call randomly somebody recommended me and through that process I needed sponsors and I happened to call on this one guy you know and this guy you know I spoke to and he said to me you know what I think you've got so much potential mm -hmm. uh, but he was in the tombstone business yeah. tombstone manufacturing so he's like I want to sponsor this whole uh, PR exercise that you're doing but afterwards I would like us to work together and, you know, he's the late Lebu Khitsan, you know, his company called Bataung. And, you know, and um, so that relationship led to a lot of breakthroughs in my life because, because of him, I, I needed, I realized then when I met with him that I actually, the reason why I was bumping against so many walls was because I didn't have a mentor. Mm. You need somebody that has walked the road. Like she was saying, you know, you need somebody that knows the game better than you. Yes. So he was that somebody. He taught me everything that I, you know, I, you, I'm using now mm. in terms of business. So I spent like four years with him. Um, working with him and... In the business in of In the business, death. yes, in the business of death. <laughs> Actually, we call it the real estate of the cemetery. We, just, we are in the real oh, estate, we're just building. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so, so in that business, we, you know, I learned a lot and he introduced me to so many people, but 
after I spent those couple of years with him, I decided I'm now, you know, I felt it was time to start my own because yeah. I learned from him and how to do it. That's when I got into the tombstone business. And that's actually the first business that really, you know, started giving me some money, you know, you know, <laughs> to make Death is big in this country, <laughs> anyway. you know? Yeah, yeah. yeah. So I, when I got into that business, you know, I, 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 I knew what to do. Mm. Unlike with these other businesses, I was struggling, I was t testing things, mm. trying out this. But with that business, I knew exactly this is what you do, this is where you go, and this is how you market it. So that's the first business that gave me a breakthrough. And then why the sneaker business? Okay, so um, uh, uh, if you listen to my story, I'm the kind of guy that if I think of something, I just go for it. Mm. You know, if it comes to my mind and I think, you know, I want to do this, I just go for it. And I realized that it's something that has been a theme in my life from a young age. Mm. You know, if I thought about, let me be a DJ, like next week, I'm You'll like, there. I'm there, you yeah. know, so I'm that guy. So, so I felt, you know, and there was a lot of people that look at me and say, you're so brave, you know, you're so brave. And, um, and then coupled, coupled that with the love that I have for sneakers, I realized that whenever you go for something or wherever you go, you gotta wear shoes. Yes. So whatever dream that you approach, shoes are very important. They, they really, you know, contribute towards your confidence. I would realize that if I was wearing the right type of shoes, whatever dream that I had, I would really go for it. You can walk in your I can purpose. walk into my purpose, you know. <laughs> With them shoes. So them shoes are very important. <laughs> if, if, if it's a, so, 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 so from that, I connected the two things. I'm a go for it type of guy and in order to go anywhere, you gotta put on the right shoes. And that just connected with me, that shoes take you everywhere. You know, why not create a shoe for dreamers, for people like me, mm. you know, that go for it. Yeah. And that's when the shoe business came about and I started the sneaker business where I started a sneaker called Vaya, mm. which means go, and the tagline is go for it. So it's all about, creating a product that will remind somebody to go for their dreams. Same as I have done with my, my life, you know, where it was, it was against the odds. You know, it was, I had a comfortable job, you know, that took me everywhere, that made me meet all these prominent people, but I still decided to just go for it. So I wanted a sneaker or a product that will represent that type of energy. And I realized that I could do it by speaking and telling people, or I could just transform that energy into a product where yeah. if they see that product, they could be reminded of that. So, but, I mean, both of your stories are absolutely amazing in the sense that while there's this traditional path, we're being told to follow the guaranteed path because oh. you just need to get a job, you just mm. need to pay your bills, you, your passions kept gnawing at you to leave whatever you're doing traditionally to go and pursue your dreams. I mean, I love your spirit and energy that you think about something and you just yeah. go for it. For me, that true entrepreneurial spirit mm. is like, what people need, I, I'm gonna sell water. I'm gonna yeah, sell, like, yes. good for you in that. And for you being an artist, knowing that you didn't see people that looked like you, but you tried it anyways, mm -hmm. and you happened to be at the right time, at the right place, with the right people on your side. Mm -hmm. What would you say the biggest lesson is that you take from your life journey to where you are now in regards to your career? Um, I think it's just not letting other people define me and not waiting for people to validate me. I think the thing that's, especially right now this year, is making me... Uh, move forward. It's just realizing that if you wait for somebody else's approval, you might wait forever. Yes. So just do what you need to do. That's just it. So one of the stories that I loved hearing about you is that you, your parents don't really understand the art space. No. But there you are with ministers <laughs> when this new coin that you actually designed was low and your parents were there. Yeah. What did they say in that moment? They couldn't say anything because Tito Mboeni was sitting literally <laughs> right Yeah, You know what I mean? <laughs> so they couldn't really say a thing. And I just 
felt like I needed that win just to show them that the world, the possibilities are really open. If so you, you open your mind, you really can do anything that you yeah. do. And I really wanted to inspire my parents as well because they are, they are a bit traditional and I am not. I think I'm just cut from a different cloth. But I think that moment they were really proud of me because yo, the phone calls I got from my family afterwards, yo, mama, are you really ready? Oh! <laughs> You know, I, I, I knew I did a good job. Who really let you call in? I'm just like, oh, the best, it just didn't stop. The best way to prove to your parents is like literally having sit the thanks. To <laughs> yeah. What is the biggest lesson for you? Um, hey, there's so many lessons in the entrepreneur <laughs> journey, but one thing that uh, stands out when I think about it is, you know. Um, God has placed, placed something in everybody's heart, yes. you know. And yes. there's something that he placed in my heart. And I felt that, you know, whatever that has happened in my life, it has been just driving me towards that. Mm. And I don't regret even the job because mm. I've, I learned a lot of things and, and that I st I'm still using now. So, but I felt, Woody, you must just listen to your heart. You really have to listen to your heart and follow it and really just go for it, you know. <laughs> Guys, your stories are so beautiful, so inspiring, and I think more and more young people need to hear from people like yourselves because we are scared to jump. Mm. It is rough out there mm. from scraping by, we're not knocking at houses saying, don't you need a number? <laughs> <laughs> you know? I mean, it's real, but the yeah. fact that you were both willing to do whatever it takes to get mm. to where you are, it's so admirable and just beautiful. And man, hashtag black excellence to yeah. the both of you. So thank you so much for coming through and chatting to us. No, this was thank lovely. you. Thank you for your <laughs> Hashtag unpacked with Lebkhile. It really is possible to do and be whoever you want to be. Don't be afraid. Take that leap of faith. And yes, our parents and the people around us are massive influences, but literally you know in your most quiet of moments the very thing that you want to be doing, the very person that you want to be. So just go for it. Thank you so much for joining us. Have a good night. Next time on Unpacked. Bulimia is a mental disorder. The core of the eating disorder actually peaked when I started working. What's different with food is you do need to eat. It's not yes. something you can yes. quit. It's almost as if food was calling me by name. My daughter, I could see, is getting skinnier and skinnier. When she passed away, she weighed 32 kilos. much for watching Unpacked with Rileb Khile Mamoja. Make sure you subscribe to my channel where you can get to watch more episodes. But more importantly, you can be part of our online community. Comment down below, share with us who you'd like to see on the show, what story you'd like us to discuss. We love engaging with you. Keep it coming and don't forget to subscribe.